Welcome everyone to episode 34 of Snippet Sports Science Podcast, your weekly dose of applied sports science literature. I'm Chris Cavillio and joined today by Jared Coleman-Stark. How are you, mate? Good, Chris. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Our podcast is proudly sponsored by EliteForm.com, so please give them a visit. They do some really cool stuff with velocity-based training, and they also have an online strength planner, which you can actually access for free. So if you're interested in their product or you just want to have an online planner that you can access through a web browser, give it a look. As I said, it's free of charge, and you actually get a feel for the system. And their camera system is really awesome. It just sits there above the rack, and away you go. We found great use with it. That's a good point. I forgot about just the strength planner. I usually think of the 3D motion tracking system, but it's a pretty good strength check planner as well. Yeah, definitely. Really easy to use and customizable. Yep. Anyhow, so the last few episodes, we've had a little bit of a nutritional tract with a lot of the papers that we've reviewed. And this one today continues along that theme, and it's called Exercise-Induced Muscle Damage. What is it? What causes it? And what are the nutritional solutions by the group of Owens et al. out of the UK? With respect to this paper, there's four main highlights and points. Firstly, exercise-induced muscle damage results in muscle soreness and a temporary loss of muscle function. That we know. Secondly, nutritional interventions that accelerate recovery of muscle function and ameliorate soreness are used frequently in athletic populations and may be beneficial for athletes in tournament scenarios or when a rapid recovery between competitive events is necessary. The third highlight is persistent use of nutritional interventions that accelerate recovery may impinge on muscle adaptation. Therefore, the goal of the nutritional intervention should be carefully considered in the context of the trade-off between recovery and adaptation. The fourth point is around considering the potential hormetic effects of long-term use of nutritional aids it is likely that a periodized approach to sports nutrition will yield the greatest benefits for the athlete. Periodized nutrition. Exercise-induced muscle damage is categorized by symptoms that present both immediately and for up to approximately 14 days after the initial exercise bout. The consequence of muscle damage for the athlete is a direct impact on functional capacity, muscle soreness, exercise capacity, and the disturbed sense of force production and limb position. The magnitude and time course of these symptoms and the subsequent impact of performance are variable and depend on the intensity and duration of the damaging exercise and the individual's susceptibility to the damaging stimulus. The associated losses in muscle function and increases in muscle soreness are important to the athletes given their potential to impair performance. Accordingly, the focus of many sports nutrition strategies is to maximize the recovery from exercise and to prepare for the next exercise bout. Numerous nutrients and functional foods have been examined for their potential to ameliorate muscle damage. However, few studies have examined the balance between adequate exercise stress to stimulate adaptation and the need to intervene to avoid inadequate recovery or maladaptation, which is a phenomenon termed hormesis. This creates a difficulty when making assumptions about chronic exposure to nutritional compounds. In this review, they provide an overview of exercise-induced muscle damage its causes, consequences, and then critically evaluates nutritional strategies that have the potential to ameliorate muscle damage. The first point around here is around the proposed mechanisms of exercise-induced muscle damage. I'm going to hand it over to Jared to talk a little bit further about it. Thanks, Chris. It's been found that high-force eccentric muscle actions typically produce ultra-structural muscle disruption, delayed onset muscle soreness, known as DOMS, increases in specific intramuscular proteins in circulation, such as creatine kinase and myoglobin, swelling of the affected limb, decreased range of motion, and impaired muscle force producing capacity. The extent of muscle damage is typically assessed by looking at those proteins that have gone into circulation, using them as indirect markers. That's why we hear a lot about creatine kinase and myoglobin in regards to exercise-induced muscle damage. The underlying mechanisms are complex and are attributed to physical damage to the sarcomere and sarcolemma from eccentric lengthening and excitation contraction coupling failure. The sensations of muscle soreness could result from a complex interaction of damage to muscle structure, disrupted calcium homeostasis, and sensitization of nociceptors, pain receptors, from inflammatory cell infiltrates. Delayed onset muscle soreness typically appears between 8 and 24 hours after muscle damaging exercise, peaks between 24 and 48 hours, and usually subsides within 96 hours. I personally find mine to be sourced at about 48 hours. I don't know about you, Chris. Would you... About two days after? Two days after. Yeah, it's usually when I peak. 
side story, a uh, long time ago, I was training for decathlon and I had to learn how to pole vault. I had no history in it. I went to a pole vault group in Adelaide and we had to do some gymnastics. You know, I thought, oh, I'm pretty strong. And they're doing all these great body weight exercises. I did a gymnastics session that I'd never done before. And Dom said in that night. Unaccustomed exercise. And I suffered for days. However, yeah, typically 48 hours. Anyway, back to the paper. Finally, the appearance of muscle-specific proteins, such as the muscle-specific creatine kinase in plasma and the myoglobin in serum, peak at two to six days after the initial injury to the muscle. The membrane damage caused by eccentric lengthening caused to increase membrane permeability and the leaking of those muscle proteins into the circulation. This means that the creatine kinase and myoglobin serve as excellent markers for the tissue damage that has occurred. The next point we're going to talk about is the dietary solutions for exercise-induced muscle damage. The first point around this is protein and amino acids. Dietary protein intake is undoubtedly a crucial factor in the regulation of muscle protein turnover, particularly in response to exercise. Adaptive processes to both resistance and endurance type exercise are enhanced when protein is fed around the exercise bout. Where the protein intake around intense or damaging exercise can alleviate aspects of muscle damage is less clear, evidence suggests protein or free amino acids fed around exercise can alleviate markers of muscle damage and accelerate recovery of force. So while protein is undoubtedly important for adaptive remodeling of skeletal muscle after any form of exercise and should never be compromised in the diet, it's unclear whether supplementing with protein after exercise-induced muscle damage actually accelerates recovery. The next point is around functional foods, and I think as a coach or any sort of health practitioner, that's something that we really try and promote in our craft. And this has the potential to exert a positive physiological effect that's related to improved or preserved human health and disease. The next section here is around functional foods and perhaps a concept that we as health professionals really try and advocate. And this section of the review focuses on the evidence derived from selected contemporary and emerging functional foods applied in exercise recovery paradigms, with particular reference to foods or their analogues that contain dietary polyphenols and fatty acids. So I'm going to put this over to you now, Jared. You want to just discuss about dietary polyphenols? Sure. So dietary polyphenols are first up. They're present in numerous fruits and vegetables that are consumed as part of a balanced diet and have been shown to possess antioxidant properties as well as anti-inflammatory properties. So everyone knows, you know, eat your fruit and veg. They're very good for you. One of the reasons for this is because of the molecules, polyphenols that exist inside them. From an exercise-induced muscle damage perspective, a dietary intervention is unlikely to interact with the primary phase of the mechanical stress during the exercise bout. What's more likely is that an interaction with the secondary cascade, which results in inflammation and the production of reactive oxygen species after the damaging exercise. So we're looking at these dietary polyphenols as a possible intervention for decreasing the inflammation in the second phase of exercise-induced muscle damage. And just quickly, when we're talking about polyphenols, we know that they're in green teas, coffee, but also grapes, cocoa, nuts, blueberries, cherries, and pomegranates. Yeah, so first one that a lot of people like to look at is crocetin. It's often a, a supplement. And what's been found so far is that crocetin fails to improve muscle function or reduce inflammation, oxidative stress, or muscle soreness. So that's one we can sort of scratch off the list straight away. Next up are the catechins, such as those found in green tea extract that we talked about in the previous episode quite a bit. This was a little bit of my point around, you know, maybe they're not very well evidenced for anything in particular, but they keep getting, they keep showing up mm. as, as small things here and there that do a lot of different beneficial things and are present in things that are more commonly known to be healthy, like green tea itself. So it's commonly found in tea and has the potential to enhance recovery from damaging exercise, although the literature on this flavonoid is scarce. An emerging food of interest for managing exercise-induced muscle damage is tart cherries. The first study to investigate the efficacy of tart cherries in exercise recovery used heavy eccentric contractions to induce unilateral muscle damage to the elbow flexors in a placebo-controlled randomized crossover design with a two-week washout, whereby the contralateral limb was used as placebo-control. Participants consumed two servings per day of cherry juice blend for a total of eight days. In response to this intervention, an accelerated rate of muscle function recovery and reduced soreness post-exercise-induced muscle damage was observed. 
So, although there's not a lot of research on the tart cherries, there is some potential for their benefit. How exactly these compounds exert their beneficial effects is, however, unclear. So, as always, more research is needed on tart cherries. Next up are pomegranate and its extracts, which are polyphenol-rich fruit that principally contain elegated tannins. Overall, there have been positive results for pomegranate that suggest it could be an effective intervention for recreational and well-trained athletes to promote recovery from exercise-induced muscle damage. From a mechanistic perspective, how these different polyphenols exert their effects is unclear. The point in the review is that pharmacological interventions are often consumed in doses that are in well in excess of the recommended daily allowance that could result in unwanted side effects, and importantly for athletic population, increases the risk of consuming contaminated supplements. The use of polyphenic rich foods is growing in interest and represents a realistic alternative for numerous areas of sport and exercise nutrition, not least in managing muscle damage and exercise recovery. Once again, let's get the big rocks right first. Let's make sure we get an adequate sleep and we're just eating good healthy food. Exactly. Eat your fruits and vegetables. This is why this is one of the many reasons that eating your fruits and vegetables is very important and very good for you. A lot of people know that fruits and vegetables are good for you, but they don't understand the specific reasons behind it. And that's one of the things that we're highlighting here is that fruits and vegetables are very polyphenol rich, which decreases your inflammation and can therefore decrease damage from the secondary phase of exercise induced muscle damage. Eating your fruits and vegetables will help you recover from exercise better. Next section, we're going to talk about omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these can be consumed as a supplement in uh, pills, fish oil, or you can actually eat fatty fish. Or nuts. That's or true. Salmon, mackerel, tuna. Flaxseed. Multiple investigations examine the effects of these fatty acids on muscle function, inflammation, and oxidative stress induced by damaging exercise. For the most part, these have shown a positive effect on one or more variables associated with exercise-induced muscle damage. All of these studies tend to use a loading phase of several days that can extend up to a month, which might go some way to explain the discrepancies and meaningful findings. The most comprehensive study to assess loading demonstrated the minimum of two weeks of supplementation with 5 grams per day of fish oil capsules is necessary to permit detectable increases in muscle fatty acid lipid composition. Only one study has showed to have no effects on muscle function, inflammation, or oxidative stress after damaging eccentric contractions. And I've actually seen in other literature that turning over those membrane lipids can take as much as a year. So, right. so yeah, so like when people are looking at the ratios of omega-6 to omega-3, uh, well, the time for those to actually fully change over it takes an entire year of consistently eating a healthy diet with appropriate levels of omega-3s. So even though you might not see an effect within uh, two weeks or whatever that most studies will look at, or in anecdotal experience, it takes a consistent diet of eating omega-3s to really be beneficial. Which is perhaps another issue with a lot of people today. They do something for two, three weeks, and they want an instant fix. You know, that people have had poor diets or poor exercise habits for years, and they expect to do something for a few weeks or a month, and go, why hasn't anything changed? It takes time to undo poor habits. Anyway, the next point is around vitamin D. This is a steroid hormone predominantly obtained in humans by exposure to ultraviolet B radiation or sunlight. Lack of sunlight exposure and predominantly indoor lifestyles have led to a large number of vitamin deficiency cases worldwide. Perhaps an issue with the current epidemic around computer games and iPads and so forth. Yeah, and having a hole in the ozone over Australia. We, we don't really feel very safe going out into the sunlight in this country because there's not much protection. Our UV index gets up to 13, 14, which I think that scale was only meant to go to 10 in yeah. the first place. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think vitamin D deficiency is now number one or number two most common deficiency. And so it's a common one for the work on. And the primary role for vitamin D is its role in calcium homeostasis and thus bone mineralization. It's now understood that the biological effects of this steroid are much wider than just calcium homeostasis. Of particular relevance to this review is the emerging data that implies that a role in muscle regeneration and remodeling as vitamin D exerts potent effects on the innate and acquired immune system, as well as directly within the skeletal muscle. Vitamin D may also play a role in modulating the immune response to exercise induced muscle damage. 
because it has been shown that vitamin D is a very strong regulator of the immune system. So that's another way that it could play with. Vitamin D deficiency has also been found to lead to selective alterations in target innervation, resulting in possible nociceptor hyperinnervation of skeletal muscle. And so that's something that not only can result in increased feelings of soreness after training, but more generalized feelings of pain. So if you're often feeling in pain all over in your muscles quite a bit, it, it can be an indicator of vitamin D deficiency. Next point's around vitamin C and vitamin E. So vitamin C and E are two essential nutrients with pleiotropic redox dependent and independent biochemical functionality. That's just a fancy way of saying that they're antioxidants. You know, we hear a lot about oxidants and antioxidants. One of the things that we see with exercise stress is that you have a lot of oxidative stress as part of that exercise stimulus. And so these could be two molecules that help to attenuate that oxidative stress. The use of these vitamins and associate nutrients is primarily based on their ability to scavenge free radicals. As Jared said, just a really good antioxidant. In conclusion, the use of vitamin C and E supplements in exercise-induced muscle damage settings appears to lack support, especially when their major nutrients may interfere with certain exercise adaptations to non-damaging exercise. Now, something I think is a bit interesting around this, just more anecdotally that doesn't have any research literature behind it whatsoever, is I think most of the literature is on uh, oral supplementation. Isn't that right? Yes. Whereas something I've heard of is actually getting an IV drip yeah, of, a, of a lot of vitamin C. Not a little bit, but a lot. And actually using that to completely clear all oxidative damage. And anecdotally from people coming, so like after a game or the other place I've heard of it from is people going to music festivals that they'll then put themselves on an IV drip the next day to recover from the substances that they use during the time. <laughs> elite <laughs> and, dancers. <laughs> the elite dancers of society. <laughs> and, um, and anecdotally, they've told me that it's extraordinary how revived they feel afterwards. Wow. So warrants for the research. Definitely. Where can we get one? There's bars. No. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. There's, there's literally, there's like IV recovery bars you can go to. In Brisbane. I'm sure there's some in Brisbane. Anyone out there in Brisbane, let us know. And if you're an IV bar owner, may I hook us up? We'll do a podcast from your IV bar. We'll do, we'll do a podcast hooked up to IVs. <laughs> That'd be great. And the last point here is creatine monohydrate. We reviewed this one in detail a few podcasts ago. Wonderful supplement. Right. So we'll just cover it very briefly today. Creatine monohydrate supplementation shows positive effects on satellite cell number and bionuclear content in response to heavy resistance exercise. This is clear and definitive. Creatine is beneficial. When administered at a dose of 24 grams per day for seven days, followed by six grams per day for the following 15 weeks, satellite cell number and myonuclear content were increased above that of a 20 gram whey protein supplement or a no training, no supplement control. The signaling mechanism by which this occurs is still elusive. However, the data are supported by in vitro insights that show creatine monohydrate induces differentiation of skeletal myoblasts. It is effective. It is one of the most heavily researched supplements in the world, and it does work. I'm sitting here, I'm thinking creatine monohydrate, leucine, carbohydrate with some caffeine. Your big three. And hook me up to an IV. I'm intrigued. <laughs> the next major point in respect to this article is the practical nutritional considerations to modulate exercise-induced muscle damage. The basis for this is predominantly concerned with interventions reducing the exercise-induced stress response, which may reduce adaptive potential, assuming the two are related. Many of the nutritional interventions highlighted here may modulate oxidative stress and inflammation, which are known to be important in the adaptive response to an exercise stimulus. As an example, blunting the pro-inflammatory phase of the repair process may be problematic as a decrease in the increase of immune cell infiltrates leads to a decrease in the diameter of new myofibers and to the development of fibrosis. This calls into question whether long-term supplementation might bring about a maladaptive response and affect long-term athletic development. Once again, nutritional periodization comes into play here. Yes, and fruits and vegetables. And this is their next point. They talk about how a balanced diet rich in fruits and vegetables is always necessary. However, when training and competition stress is high and recovery is unlikely to be achieved before the next competition, 
or high intensity training session, there's certain rationale to supplement with additional foods that could help manage the negative effects of the exercise stressor. And in particular with our busy lifestyle, if you're in between sessions, it's better to be able to reach for some supplements or some certain protein or amino acids. And although not ideal, this is much better than 595 Hungry Jack's meal deal. Or alternatively, why don't you actually just pack some fruit? Not hard. Yeah. And cheaper. Yeah. Or get some steamed veggies as well. You know, those little frozen packs. And then you just chuck, a, it comes in one and two serves in a steam bag. Chuck it into the microwave. Three minutes later, you have a serving or two of vegetables. I've been doing it late. It's so convenient. Any sauce with that? Always hot sauce. I have an entire collection of hot sauce in the fridge. I've got patio, I've got sriracha, I've got cholula. You know, I've got Korean hot sauces that I have no idea what the names actually are. Sounds delicious. They are. So in review, we've just looked at omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, tart cherries, vitamin D, protein, and creatine monohydrate, all of which have a degree of evidence for them and have some sort of magnitude of effect on your exercise-induced muscle damage. But first and foremost, if you feel like you're experiencing a bit too much muscle damage from your training, make sure you're eating enough fruit and veggies. Definitely. That pretty much brings us to the end of the paper. Any concluding thoughts with this, Jared? Eat your fruits and veggies. Beautiful. Clean, to the point, cheaper, much better for you. Right. And, I mean, a lot of this was on nutritional interventions, but also just considering the, the mechanism of exercise-induced muscle damage. The way that you get muscle damage is unaccustomed or eccentric exercise. And so to avoid exercise-induced muscle damage, which isn't necessarily necessary for adaptation, you could just avoid eccentric or unaccustomed exercise. You could. Could. But you wouldn't get any better. Yeah, I think you'd get a bit better. You know, if, you, um, if you're doing sleds, it's a very concentric, dominated exercise. You don't have a whole lot of eccentric loading. And after a while, you do get accustomed to it. But as we know, as you become accustomed to exercise, you get decreasing returns. So you might not get as much better, but I think you'll still get better. Can still get better. Okay. Yeah. Point. Yeah, nice there. Good debating today, Joe. I really enjoyed that discussion with you. Yeah, we've had some back and forth. It's been good. Yeah, really good. Yeah. And thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, listeners, for joining us. Remember to visit our socials at Snippet Science. It's S-N-I-P-P-I-T Science. And also our website. We've been putting our episodes up there on the website. If you're unable to get our podcast through iTunes or through your own portable player. So we've actually got up there. And once again, really appreciate EliteForm.com for coming on board and helping us out with the podcast. That's right. You can listen to the podcast directly on the website now, which is great. Thank you, Chris, for saying that up. Thanks for listening.